paintings for what, like probably a year now? They're online. They're online, and you said there's so much you'll get hundreds? Yeah, we'll I mean, yeah, these. so if you have a company that we know would be a good speaker, and you know, help it'll help them get a little promotion. So. Well, I had no idea it was that kind of volume of so watching these podcasts. thousands, thousands, <laughs> hundreds of thousands. Uh, not yet. <laughs> My name's Sammy Graham. I'm with CUD, uh, ex uh, program chairman, trying to get out of it. Today. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate everybody showing up today. Um, just remind everyone to turn your phones off. Or we may listen to whatever that conversation is when it does ring. <laughs> or a $50 fine to the speaker. Any of that works. A few few items before I introduce the speaker. September 24th is our uh, API golf tournament. It's out at Lake Hefner. Again, this is our one source of money we raise each year for our scholarships. We've already got several teams uh, entered in that thing. Uh, there'll be food out on the course. It's, it's always a good time. You can go to the uh, website and find information about it. Uh, next month, our speaker is Travis Gray with Basin Consultings Group. Uh, he's going to talk about downhole flow profile, and I believe that's our last uh, luncheon for this year's group. We kick off in September. Uh, Stephanie Bice will be our speaker again this year. Jeremiah? Yeah. Our oh. legislative stuff, yeah. And do we, are we still going to know about Gleasy Park, or are we just trying to find some place? We've been talking about either in there or Scissor Tail. Still, okay. That hadn't been decided yet. Okay. Uh, Phil, any other? Golf tournament. Right that out. Yeah. <laughs> September 24th. September 24th. Yeah. Just want to make sure it's mentioned on camera. Cleffy, the golf tournament is, as Sammy said, the 24th of September at Heffern. And we've actually had some people already sign up. Uh, today it's an honor to introduce John Hattenberg. He is a well control engineer with Cut Well Control out of Houston. Uh, he's a Texas a and grad. He's been doing this type of business now for 18 years, still alive. Um, uh, quite a business that he does. He holds a, a bachelor of science degree in petroleum engineer from the Texas from Texas A&M University. Let's give him a warm welcome. Thanks, you. So, uh, thank you to API for inviting me to come in and uh, talk about the well pad cascade failure. What? Well pad cascade failure is is uh, you know in re the recent history the recent past the uh, operators have to save time and money and uh, save money on production uh, equipment they have started to co uh, coalesce their drilling of the uh, pads but when what happens is that when a well blows out on a pad and catches fire you could have issues with other wells in the pad uh, they you know the the radiant heat from the wells that are blowing out. Could cause other wells in the pad their uh, their uh, surface equipment to give up and to, to blow out, and then they, those catch fire. And then cascade. Uh, the, the record is seven wells on one pad. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> and what what the problem is with with was one, that here in the United States where that happened? Yes, yes. In the last ten years. So the big problem is with uh, well cascade failure is that uh, it's, it's difficult enough dealing with one well blowing out, but things just become exponentially more difficult when there's other wells around you blowing out. Uh, the, like, you know, with one well blowing out, usually there's less infrastructure if it's, a, if it's like a single well pad. Uh, you can come in from multiple angles. With a with well pad, with, with a whole bunch of wells on it and different uh, uh, production, Equipment you're only limited to one approach. Then the radiant heat. This these these wells just uh, they uh, they build on each other with the heat. So you could be uh, like 50 yards away and just and just be really really hot. So today I have uh, uh, three focuses. If you have, if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, go ahead and just raise your hand and and, and ask. 
And I'm gonna pause, there's three different sections where I'm gonna talk about the uh, uh, well bed drilling and, and why uh, the consequences of having a blowout on a well bed and then talk about prevention, how to prevent these things from happening and then uh, what happens when the stuff hits the fan, what do you do? And it gets quite expensive. So it's better to prevent than to respond to. So in, in the last five years, there was an operator in continental United States. Uh, they were performing flowback operations on a four wheel pad and they, had a, they didn't have the other well shut in on the pad. Uh, Something happened, we're not really sure what happened, but the well blew out. It was, a, it was a, quite a prolific well. It was right after a big frack, and it blew out like we think about 100, 120 million uh, standard cubic foot a day. Uh, the, the fire was so intense and hot, and melted the other uh, wells on the pad, and they all blew out as well. So there's two, there's two big wells between 100 and 120 million, and two little wells between uh, 20 and 30 million cubic foot a day. On this pad that blew up, and I was I was like other like not just one well control company came in to handle this uh, this pad blow, and it was such a, a big thing that uh, they brought in multiple well control companies. I was brought in to help out with the relief well cleaning. They didn't even they didn't even know if they would be able to fix this thing from surface in a timely manner before a relief well that maybe takes two months to drill could get there and and, and poke a hole in the casing and and fill it up with kiln wood. So they brought in all these well control companies. Uh, they're, they're working on fixing, the, fixing these four wells. And it looks, it looks like the surface intervention is going to progress faster than the relief well. We had built the pad. We hadn't really brought in the rig yet for the relief well. So I got transferred to uh, the well site to help with the you know, dynamic kill later and, and help with engineering procedures, et cetera. We ended up fixing the problem. It took us 60 days to fix it. And uh, I thought that was pretty good, you know, considering it's 200 million cubic, cubic foot a day wells plus two 20 to 30 million cubic foot a day wells. But uh, later on, Cud was, has been talking to, you know, fast forward a few years, Cud was talking to some uh, insurance brokers about setting up this new product for uh, controllable well insurance. And the zeitgeist in the what could, or the insurance industry was that this took too long to fix. So they what had happened? I, I imagine some bean counter named Poindexter. He's like, you know, uh, adding up the wells. Like you know, a twenty million cubic foot a day well typically takes you know five days to fix. A uh, hundred million cubic foot a, a day well takes you know two weeks to fix. So. They added everything up and they thought maybe it should take it 35 days instead of six days. They don't really know about all the issues that go on with these multi, with these uh, cascade failures. Uh, talked to a senior uh, hand before the presentation and he said, anything that you're doing in the fire or in, in the heat zone, the red zone, when you're dealing with these multi-well pad blocks, you need to multiply whatever you're doing by two to four times. It's just gonna take you so much longer. And when these, when these wells are really super hot, you have, to, you have to stage in your, we have these things called water monitors, these stands, they have uh, corrugated tin on them to protect the people inside from the heat and they, they spray water. You have to, it's so hot, you can't just stick one out there and spray where you're trying to work. You have to, you have to stage in, you have to have uh, one spraying water far enough away, then you have to stage another water monitor and then another one before, before you finally get to uh, the well you can start working. It may take like an hour to, to stage all these water monitors in. This is even after you know practicing for 60 days, you know, staging in and, and out every day. You can't just leave the stuff there overnight, so you gotta stage out. So it just it makes everything exponentially more difficult. So like I said, pad drilling uh, it's, it's a good way for operators to save time and money. Uh, but on the flip side, the the risk may be low because there's only been about uh, less than a dozen of these cascade failures in the past 10 years, right? But when they do happen, the cost is astronomical. So the, the, the consequence is really high, maybe the risk is really low, but as more and more pad drilling is going on, we're seeing more and more rise in interest from 
uh, operators, governments into uh, doing some type of pre-planning, like you know, some of the things I'll get into about prevention. Uh, we had a, a, a company in South America was tasked by the governmental agency in that country to look at prevention methods, and, and I, I ran the project, the engineering project for that. Uh, we did uh, relief flow planning, dynamic kill analysis for you know how much mud, how fast, at what weight to pump when if you're intercepting one of these block wells. Uh, we came up with the block contingency plan, what to do in case the well blows out, who do you call, what's the notifications, who does what. You don't want like, you know, three people ordering 300 ton cranes, you want one person doing that. Um, a rig fallover study, you know, this, because they're gonna be drilling on these pads. And if, if, if the rig, this drilling blows out, the rig's gonna fall over and heaven forbid it falls over on a, another well on the pad. Could crush that, crush that well. We did a, a force calculation study. Uh, capping plan, which I have more in the response. I have some of the, the knowledge from, from that in the response section. And then a radiant heat modeling. So we did, we did this whole engineering analysis and it's still ongoing uh, to, for them to get permission from the government uh, to uh, drill these wells. And, you know, I know offshore it became the situation where you had to have really full planning and dynamic, dynamic kill analysis for drilling a well offshore, but maybe the industry should get ahead of the government and, and, and maybe like if there's if there's pad drilling, think about these things, like what happens if there's a cascade failure, and get ahead of it before the government steps in and says, okay, you have to do all these engineering analyses ahead of time. So, like I said, you know, the, the risk is low, because it hasn't happened very much, but, you know, in, I guess in recent history is when these these pad drilling phenomena has, has really took off, but the, you know, the consequence can be very high. This is a uh, like a two well pad that um, so one, one well blew out and caused the other one to blow out. So this wasn't as bad as like a seven well pad. I have a picture of that one. So we, we've been tax, tasked in the past to determine what at what temperature do well components fail. And we've, we've uh, worked with uh, uh, our software called Aloha. It's a sophisticated uh, uh, radiant heat modeling software. And we've also looked at uh, API uh, papers and recommendations. And the, the yellow one here represents 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. And according to API specification 6SFA 1999, the third edition uh, of uh, wellhead components will fail at 1400 degrees within 30 minutes and there's not there's not a lot of information out there that we we, we did a, a big search but there's not like a lot of information or uh, tests done that we could find that uh, talk about like at what point do wellhead components fail because I, I guess there hasn't been a lot of interest uh, but maybe in the future uh, there will be now for as far as like that's that's within 30 minutes but we, for, we had to check with our senior well control specialists. We had to check with uh, uh, Patterson and Prime. They do a lot of equipment. They, they bring equipment in during uh, blowouts and fires. What, we asked them, what, at what temperature can a, can a wellhead component survive indefinitely? And anecdotally, they said 250 degrees. That's the green line here, 250 degrees. Uh, so somewhere, somewhere between the yellow line and the green line, your component's going to fail between, you know, uh, a day or, or 30 minutes. Uh, but there's not a lot of there's not a lot of data on that. So I don't know. Maybe somebody wants to spend the money and or the time and, and, and do like an API study that'd be or an SPE paper that'd be great. So on the, on the left hand, I don't. I, I guess the it's kind of, it's kind of uh, hard to read, but. Back here, so the, the left graph is a uh, gas and oil blowout. So this this represents a 20 million cubic foot a day uh, gas flow with about 40,000 barrels of oil per day. And on the right hand side, this is a 20,000 million cubic foot a day uh, blow. And I don't know if you can see from the back, but 
at 17 meters, this was for South America, uh, that's why everything's in meters, but at 17 meters, you're above the 1400 degree fill line. So what, is, what does this mean? You probably need to uh, erect some sort of uh, uh, concrete barrier, some tor sort of concrete corrugated tin barrier uh, to, protect, to protect your wells that are within uh, 17 meters. Or, uh, you know, have the wells underground or, uh, you know, the, the top of the well will be below the surface. Uh, but they, their spacing in South America was uh, 10 meters. So the, it's a fail. If they have one one blow out, these other wells are going to blow out if they just leave things alone. It's even worse for a pure gas blow out. The, the 1400 degree is up to uh, 47 meters away, right? And they have 10, they have 10 uh, meter spacing on these wells. So they're going to, they're going to blow out like six wells at a time. So, uh, cross your fingers that nothing like that happens. This is a this is a picture of the seven mil pad uh, blowout. I say I say this is a seven mil pad blowout. There's seven wells on the pad, and miraculously, I don't know how one of the wells didn't blow out, but six of them blew out. But it took it took the I think it was like three or four weeks to, to fix all these wells. Wasn't that in the Hayes pool? No. no, this one no. So, so now I'm going to talk about prevention methods. Does anybody have any, anybody have any questions or comments? What do you see as the, the primary failure component in the cascade effect? Is it rings? Is it valves? The, the soft stuff in the, the wellhead. I'm not like a wellhead expert, but I've been told it's the, the soft things like in the, the ring valves in the, in the wellhead or in the, in the wellhead equipment up top. Not the rings, not the, not the ring gaskets, but the, the seals and the valves. The seals, the seals, yeah. The, the stuff that'll melt, yeah. But given enough temperature, everything will melt, you know. But the, I guess the, the soft stuff is what gives up first, and then and then everything just kind of cascades from there, and the thing gives up. So, uh, as a preface to the prevention section. Uh, things are kind of new still with, with people thinking about these cascade failures. We, we, in the past, people in the well control industry have worked with uh, operators to come up with different ideas about how to prevent things. But maybe maybe somebody in the in the group today will come up with some idea that will fix everything. It's, it's, it's still pretty new. So every every pad is different, and, and, and people well control understand that you know you have different uh, uh, profitability requirements. You know, uh, risk cost analysis is different for every pad. Uh, but you know, some of the some of the suggestions that we present may be useful for for you as an operator. And also, uh, you know, talk to your insurance company, your well control insurance company, because because they make money reducing risk. And if, you know, the risk might be low, but the, the consequence is very high on some of these well pad blowouts. So you could say, hey, I want to put in subsurface safety valves, but it's too expensive. Could you give me, you know, a, a deal on the insurance or could you go have these with me? I don't know. Maybe it's, it's something worth talking about. And this is kind of crass, but uh, maybe after, wait till like another uh, well, big well pad blows out and it gets in the news like some of the ones in the past. And then you can talk to your uh, insurance company about that, they might be more amenable to talking. So first uh, uh, method of prevention uh, that well control, people in the well control industry suggest is uh, wellhead equipment surveys. This is a, this is a rating system using an internally developed methodology from the, the different well control industries. We'll look at things like the, uh, the pressure readings on the wellhead equipment, uh, the flange sizes, bolt plug conditions, and, and much more. And we can even assign like a, a red, yellow, and green value to each wellhead that you have. Uh, this is really good for like old uh, gas injection and production fields. They're, they can go out and see, okay, this is, these two wells are probably, you know, red, which probably go work those over. <clears throat> And, you know, we, we have our own methodology, but if, if you're an operator and this interests you, we can, and you have different criteria that you want to investigate, we can tailor our 
inspection methodology to do whatever requirements you have. Uh, back to the radiant heat modeling can be used as a prevention tool. Uh, you know, figure figure out you know where's at what point at what distance are other wells in the area gonna fail? Do do the, uh, the I guess the cost benefit analysis. Do you want to bury these wells? Like have the have the top of the the wellhead equipment below the, the uh, surface, or do you want to maybe pre-stage corrugated tin between all the wells? Uh, you know, maybe place permanent concrete barriers. Say, okay, we're like in the red zone and everything. We need to spend the money and put uh, subsurface safety valves on our, all our wells. You know, it's some it's a tool that you could use to maybe go to your manager or the money people and say, hey, we need to we need to do this because it's going to be really the consequences are going to be very bad if this well blows up. It's a this is a picture from our. Uh, report for the South America company about the rig follower study. We used the uh, uh, angular momentum calculations, uh, structure impact, and, and, and we figured out like which, which way the rig was gonna probably fall in the event of a, a fire. And uh, uh, we're, still, we're still completing that. This is, this is the final part of the engineering study, uh, but it's, it's something that we've done before we can do again. And uh, the, I think the government in South America is gonna make the operator built uh, cages, stress cages around. They're going to look at these numbers and see if a cage could withstand the force of an impact from a, a rig. But you know, you know, it's the government. They'll, they'll make them. They may make them do that. Here's a here's a preventative picture of using corrugated tin. Uh, you could you could have this place ahead of time. You could have it set aside in case it already pre-built. Because a lot of times in the response part of this. Like if there's a, a, a well blowing out on a pad, we rush the location, we try, we try to shut down, kill, and secure all the other wells on the pad so that there's not this cascade effect because it's so much easier for us to deal with one blowout and it's a lot less expensive for the customer. It makes them happy. Um, so you can have these pre-built sitting to the, on the side of the location ready to put on location if, uh, if a well catches fire or you can have them set up uh, with barriers in between all the wells already. So another, uh, from talking to operators, another uh, preventative method is, well, first of all, all the, all the infrastructure on a, on a pad, it's all at like right angles. This is because, you know, for saving costs, this is how the equipment was designed. Um, but one, from, from looking at, from dealing with customers that had these um, cascade failures in the past, they think that maybe if they were to stagger everything diagonally, because a big, a big problem is when, like if you have the, the wing valve on a, on a well, it, it, it fails because of the heat. You could have, instead of radiant heat, you could have direct heat, like a direct flame going on to another well and your, your offset well could fail like that. And because a lot of these pads are set up in like right angles, you could have like, you know, direct heat, direct heat, direct heat, and it just, it fails, they all fail very quickly. So maybe staggering, making uh, the full lines diagonal, diagonal that would help. But it's not, it's not always economical. The, the equipment's not there, but it's maybe something for the uh, operators to think about. Simops, sim simultaneous operations. Uh, so simple form of SEMOPS, I was in Yemen and we were drilling a relief well for a blowout well. This is a huge like uh, 40 yard crater, 40 yard across crater. And when we were drilling the relief well, we made intercept and we had somebody with a, uh, a uh, walkie talkie talking to the guys on the rig as they were pumping the kill and telling them what was going on with the, with the well. It's like, hey, the fire stopped, the gas has stopped, you, know, you can slow down your rates. Etc. Uh, that's that's working in emergency situations. Uh, Signups, but more complicated. Something that operators could could use while doing uh, multi well pad drilling is uh, uh, maybe you know if you're if you're fracking a well or if you're filling back a well, shut in those other wells that are nearby uh, in the red zone. Shut them in. Uh, a lot of time, like I think maybe 50% of the 
the cascade failures that we've had to deal with are because of flowbacks or, or problems with fracking. You're drilling a drilling a well. Have those other wells shut in. If it's if it's economical, think you know run run the risk cac, the risk the uh, risk cost analysis. A great a great tool to prevent uh, cascade failures is uh, subsurface safety valves. Right, a lot of there's. I, I was doing some research for this, and there's a lot of different subsurface safety valve companies and types. So uh, you could probably find something to meet, meet your uh, needs, uh, but they can be expensive. Uh, so you know, talk to your insurance company. Maybe they can work out a deal. Uh, but they'd be good to have if you're if you're at that high risk. You know, uh, the subsurface so, so safety valves come in a wide range of technologies, but they. Uh, tend to have like a fail safe or dead man uh, system. So like if uh, uh, there's like too much pressure loss or the, like their uh, umbilical that, that goes to the bottom of the well, like uh, is cut or something like that, they're, uh, they shut. So that could, that could save, save your rear in a situation. Do you have any questions about uh, prevention or Suggestions or thoughts? We'll hammer you when you get done. All right. <laughs> so now, what do you, when the stuff hits the fan and you do have a multi well pad or you, you do have this cascade failure, you know, what happens? What do you do? Uh, there's a wide variety of different specialized uh, techniques and technologies that well control companies use companies use but the main the main thing that we're worried about throughout the whole process is containment we don't want more wells blowing out we want to keep those wells that are uh, uh, safe and secure safe and secure because it's a lot easier to handle like a two well blowout than like a seven well blowout exponentially easier <clears throat> big thing with prevention is water supply you're going to need water and a lot of it. And even if you have one well blowing out on a pad, you're, you're, you're gonna need enough water to handle all the wells blowing on the pad. Because there's a well control company, uh, won't say who, but they were, uh, they came with like one pump and they had two monitors. They were put, putting like 2,000 gallons a minute on this well. And uh, they thought they had the other wells on the pad secure. There's not gonna be an issue. And then so, something happened and they had all the wells on the, well, on the pad fail. So then they had to go to the operator and say, uh, you know, sorry, but we're gonna need four days to ramp up our infrastructure to, to handle all these wells. And the operator was not too happy about that. And when it came time to renew the, the well control contract, they, they brought that up. But the, the rule of thumb when you're dealing with a multi-well pad that has the chance for cascade failure is you need enough water for eight days worth of work, 10 hours of work a day, pumping 8,000 gallons a minute. That is a lot of water. And don't get out, don't get out your calculators, I got it. It's 114,286 barrels of water a day. So this is why if you have one of these issues, the well control company may come and, and say, hey, you need to start digging pits. You know, we need one or two additional pits of 100 by 150 foot by 12 foot deep. So why do we why do we only work 10 hours a day? Well, we tend not to want to work on blowouts in uh, in the red zone uh, on off like if there's not good daylight. It's just it's just something we learned through blood, you know, sp spilling blood over over the years uh, and. Companies sometimes they, they try to work it on these bullets at night and it, it always ends up uh, bad. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean to, to say that we're just going to sit around. We'll maybe work on infrastructure or other things, but we're, we won't be in the red zone at night. Oh, so this is a this is a picture of see the, these uh, these uh, fire uh, monitors. These water monitors are spraying on the. Well, and I think I think somebody in this picture was like approaching. They had like a little uh, corrugated tin shield, and they were approaching to do a visual inspection. But they had they had to have another water monitor spraying on these guys 
to keep them cool. You know, they these guys had to keep the guy cool, and these this uh, uh, monitor stand had to keep those uh, water monitor stand cool. And and sometimes it's the case that you can't dig all the pits that you need in time, or like for whatever reason. And, and then it's like you're having to truck in water, you're having to store water in uh, frack tanks. You may you know need like a hundred frack tanks or something. Uh, it gets it gets quite outrageous. So I guess the moral of the story is don't have a multi well pit trust game failure. So another another uh, piece of the puzzle when we're performing response is uh, all the different uh, fabrication that's going on. Uh, Heat shields. We're, one control company is going to come in and just put heat shields on everything. Like uh, we, we use uh, 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 bulldozers to to back up our empty wagon. I'll show a picture of that later. But we, we wrap everything in heat shields to protect protects the equipment and the people. So we'll have this plus water going on top of the bulldozer as it's backing up. And you know if we're trying to like grab on something or rip it off or uh, use our abrasive jet cutter, and then uh, the uh, the water monitor stands, they come with a, a heat shield in the front. But this this was for a job that it was a multi-well pad blowout. And it was so hot. That's, that's the same one I was telling you about in the story. We had, they had to put heat shields on the side. Everywhere. And also, uh, uh, you have to build venturi tubes. When you're dealing with multiple wells uh, that are on fire, you can set a venturi, if you have all the other bolts going straight up and down, you can set a venturi tube, like a 30 foot venturi tube, and it takes the fire and it puts it higher, like, like 30 foot up in the air. And for whatever reason, it's, it's like you could, you could walk underneath the fire and it'd be completely cool because it has this uh, venturi effect. Here's a, here's a pic of uh, uh, them placing the venturi tube on the fire. I think they were gonna place the venturi tube here and then go in and start cutting up this rib that it collapsed. Uh, you can you can place a venturi tube with the with the empty wagon, and then sometimes they can if the you know offset wells aren't too hot, you can build like a permanent platform and place a venturi tube, and and then and then you you don't have to like come in and out with the empty wagon all the time. This is the this is the empty wagon. We'll hook up our uh, jet cutter hooks on the back of that. I'll show you how the jet cutter works. Uh, you know we use this for pretty much everything. So do you have staging areas where you keep some of the equipment always? Yeah. Yeah. You guys go in and pull them out and take them away? Yes. If it, uh, a lot of times we have to, if it's a really hot blow up, we have to pull everything out and put it, put it back in the staging area before we go home at night. And it gets really tedious. Here's a, here's a picture of our jet cutter in action. Uh, so if there's not, like good casing or a well head, like or so if there's like a, a, a good flange on top of the well, we can come in and put a thing called a capping stack. It's all it's a bunch of valves. We put them on top, we can close it in or we can uh, uh, have have the ball diverted. Uh, but if there's not like here the the casing's all mangled, so we had to come in with our jet cutter and pump uh, high pressure high velocity water with abrasive materials in it. And we had to cut this casing and get a good, fine, clean uh, cut on this well that we could go then go in and put a new well head on and then put the capping stack on top of that. And that's just sand? For your sand, water. sand and water. 5,000 PSI, 5, 000, five gallons a minute with abrasive sand. Now, like I said, when uh, you're you're doing this uh, work on pads that have, have experienced cascade failure. Uh, you, need, you need to secure the other wells on, on the pad. Uh, go in, hook up to them, pump them dead. Uh, secure them with heat shields so they you know they don't have failures. Also, if the equipment at the surface is too mangled to to do anything to find good casing to cut. They have to excavate, and this is when it gets complicated on these these pads with all this production equipment. You'll have to you'll have to go and make sure all the lines are like uh, no have no pressure on them, and start just start ripping stuff or get get rid of it somehow, so you can you can start digging down to find good casings that you can cap. And this is this is quite a uh, a treat. And a lot of, a lot of times.
sometimes it's it's good to have good records and pictures of what your pad looks like because uh, in these fires like things crumple or they collapse and and we may not, not even like we just see like a pile of metal and we don't know what that was and it's good to you know we don't want to we don't want to be digging down thinking that there's nothing in the ground and then we we rip some line that has pressure on it you know it's good to have good records and, and pictures of what your pad production uh, looks like. So after after all the wells on the pad that are blown out have uh, uh, flames uh, going straight up, we could go in and set venturi tubes on the wells that we're not working on, and we could go in and cap the well. And sometimes. Uh, the wells are so like a lot of times we could cap a well and we could just shut it in and it's fine But sometimes the pressures are too high or the blood rates are too high and we don't want to shut the well in And then we pop the, the, the well head off right because we had not been able to test the well head So so we have to put it on diverter. Here's a picture of uh, So here's here's a well blowing out and then off off camera Here's the well and it has a it has a flow line coming to a <coughs> truck manifold going to a uh, a burn pit. So we have, we'll have to uh, put the well in a burn pit and then we can get on top of the well that's blowing out and uh, go with cold tubing, snub it, we can snub in, uh, uh, if, if, it's, if the pressures and the rates were way too high, we'll have to snub into the well at the bottom and then we can fill it with the uh, mud to kill it. Here's, here's, a, here's a picture of uh, Four wells. There's four wells here that are on uh, diversion, uh, diverting, and uh, we hooked up to two of them and we bullheaded them dead. The two, the two little ones and the two big ones. We had to rig up uh, cold tubing and go to the bottom and dynamically kill them with 18 pound per gallon button. Well, you know when we go when we rig up to a well that's on that's been diverted. We'll uh, 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 run our dynamic kill software to determine ahead of time that you know we have the right kill mode weight uh, rate that we're pumping. If we can handle all the pressures through the cold tubing, uh, if we have enough mud available, we'll, we'll do all the engineering analysis ahead of time so we don't get out there and try to kill something and then it doesn't work or we you know mess something up. So thank you to API for having me. Uh, we talked about you know well pad uh, cascade failures. The, the risk is low because there haven't been many in the past ten years, maybe less than a dozen. But the the consequences are very high. So it's, it's something to think about. Uh, the ways to prevent them. I gave you some some tips or some thoughts. Maybe maybe you have better uh, ways of uh, helping to prevent these uh, cascade failures. And you know. Check with your insurance, roll control insurance company. Maybe they have some uh, uh, cost savings for you. Uh, if you if you were to put like ECSVs and all your other offset wells or uh, you know uh, rated heat analysis isn't, isn't that expensive either. And then uh, responding to blowouts, it's it's uh, it's quite exponentially more difficult to handle multiple wells than one well. You know that's that's why the the, uh, the cost is so high when when dealing with these multi-well pad balls. What was your last cascade failure that you worked? 2019. Yeah. How long did it take you to get it all up? 60 days. 60 days. Yeah. How many oil remediation companies are there? So I guess Cud, Boots and Coots. Cud, Boots and Coots, Wild Well, that was like Safety Boss in Canada, and there's like a uh, alert in uh, Singapore. And so, how do the con the contracts work with those companies? It kind of like um, Exxon or somebody kind of pays a little bit over time just to make sure that you'll be available. That'd be nice. Uh, I'll talk to you after this. <laughs> but what what happens is that because uh, I mean, if there's only twelve, you know, a year, and there's only there's four companies that say three a year, I don't mm -hmm. know if that's enough to keep a whole company. 
alive for a year. Yeah, that's what, because when when there's a down dip in the industry, well control companies get hurt because they there's no work going on, no big blowouts. So that's why, you know, some of them are right now in chapter 11 or at being sold and uh, not financially secure. Uh, but what, to answer your question, uh, operators set up MSAs, master service agreements with these companies and they have pre-agreed upon prices. Um, and also to dovetail on top of that, like when you are working with the well control company to set up a blowout contingency plan, we will also tell you the different vendors that you need to set up MSAs with ahead of time to handle blowouts because you don't want to be calling up the, the mud company during an emergency because everything's triple. You know, talk about the prices ahead of time and get, get the contract set up ahead of time so you're not having to scramble around and, and pay all this extra money. But I think, Aaron, you know, too, you're looking at, at the cascade failures. There's multiple other failures during production, during drilling yeah. that adds to that. So there is a lot more than just this particular cascade failure. Mm -hmm. most, most rental tools and uh, yeah. consulting services. Mm -hmm. But you guys have a preventative program where you're actually going out to uh, the operators well sites you know way before they call you for a mm -hmm. you know yeah that's the that's the well head equipment surveys yep. uh, rating heat analysis would be good for people that are pad drilling uh, to see like what's going to happen to these other wells so they need to implement more uh, infrastructure blowout contingency plans now you can you can still fix a well that blows out without a blowout contingency plan but it really makes life easier if everybody has assigned roles and responsibilities. You have MSAs with all your different vendors, uh, and then you have like a call out list. There was a there was a company in uh, Tennessee, a small mom and pop driller, and they didn't have a BCP set up. They didn't have oil control insurance, but they had a blowout. And uh, uh, I guess they were thinking that they they called up a oil control company to come out to fix the well. And I remember the talking to the senior specialist that was on the job. And I'm like, you know. They didn't, want to, they didn't want to tell the Tennessee regulatory agency? No, they were trying to hide it. <laughs> so uh, somebody reported in the news and the Tennessee regulatory agency heard about this blowout that happened that wasn't reported and they came to the location and they, they fined the company into oblivion. But you know, maybe if they would have had a, I guess maybe they didn't know to call the Tennessee regulatory agency and then it was too late and they didn't want to, they were trying to hide it and, uh, but it's good to have all those notifications written down because when when your driller's arm is broken, the motor hand is you know missing a finger, and everybody's running around like, are you really going to think about who to call? It's nice to have things. You know, here's one, two, three, four. This is what you need to do when a well blows out. With the new modern rigs and, and all the technology that's improved, has that decreased your business? Has that yes. had an effect on your business? Yes. So, and, and the new drilling techniques, uh, we're seeing most of our, like in 2008, most of our business came from like drilling rigs. Uh, you know, uh, they were, were like, doing a lot of underbalanced drilling at that time. Yeah, they were, they were. But now, most of our business comes from flowbacks and, and workovers and uh, production wells, and not, not a lot from drilling. Because, you know, you couldn't make some of these wells blow out if you tried. Water wells. Yeah. I called you on the water well. Okay. North of Vegas. Who'd you call? Cut it. Okay. I could have fixed it, but it was a big deal, so. Yeah. <laughs> All they did is take Albert and got a crane and put the chicks in the hole and tell the little scene. But they burned up the rig, the little water well rig. Yeah. That's it. Are you, are, you, are you kicking him out? Are you ready? Questions? Questions? Any more questions? Yeah. You'll stay around for a little bit after. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks, John. Thank you. <laughs> you go to the Middle East for their next blowout. Yeah. We've got something here. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, John. We'll see everyone next yeah. month. Thank you.